Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today from various locations around Winnipeg, all within Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our drinking water comes from Show Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, though I'm currently found at the Henderson Library, and in the words of Robert Burns, Oh, my love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. Across the screen for me is... Hi, I'm Trevor. I work at the Louis Rail Library, and I have waited 51 years, 9 months, and 4 days and nights to discuss this book with you two. <laughs> <laughs> and across the screen for me is... Hi, I'm Toby. I'm an outreach librarian based out of Millennium Library, and um, I could really use a café con leche for this discussion. Mm-hmm. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engine old and hairy day. Yeah. So keep it down, leave me alone. Close the doors and turn off the phone. Cause all I ever really need is a little more time to read. And you, dear readers, we wouldn't do this without you. We love hearing your opinions about the books we're reading almost as much as we love reading those books. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you hang around until the end of the episode, you can enjoy our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a moment, Trevor will give us a summary of the book, but first, Toby will tell us a bit about the author. Okay, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, he lived a very long, full life. Near the end of his life, he published one part of what was going to be a three-part autobiography. So he had a lot of stuff going on in his life, and I've tried to capture the highlights, and hopefully I've done a good job. He was affectionately known as Gabo. He was born on March 6th, 1927 in a small town in Colombia. He spent the first part of his life with his maternal grandparents, who were very influential. His grandfather would tell him stories of his involvement in Colombia's civil wars, and his grandmother was highly superstitious, often talking of ghosts, premonitions, and omens. He published his first poems in his school magazine. After secondary school, he went to study law at the National University of Columbia, but abandoned his studies to start a career in journalism. In the early 1950s, he worked as a newspaper reporter, using spare time to write fiction. His first short novel, Leaf Storm, was published in 1955. By the 1960s, he had published three novels that were successful in Latin America, but not internationally. His fourth novel, 100 Years of Solitude, changed all that. This novel popularized the genre of magical realism, a style of fiction that depicts the real world with an undercurrent of magic. While this was not the first example of this genre, uh, um, and Marquez made no claim to invent it, it did help start a boom in Latin American literature and influenced writers of many nationalities, perhaps most notably Isabel Allende and Salman Rushdie. Marquez himself was amazed at the success of 100 Years of Solitude. He thought his novel, Autumn of the Patriarch, was actually better. Other well-known novels of his include Chronicle of a Death Foretold, Love in the Time of Cholera, and The General in His Labyrinth. In an interview in 1981, he said, I was asked the other day if I would be interested in the Nobel Prize, but I think for me it would be an absolute catastrophe. I would certainly be interested in deserving it, but to receive it would be terrible. It would just complicate even more the problems of fame. The only thing I really regret in life is not having a daughter. Um, Yeah, (laughs) he was awarded the Nobel Prize the following year in 1982. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, He believed that writers should speak out about political issues. He was very left-wing and outspoken about the domination of Latin America by the U.S. He was a big supporter of Fidel Castro, and the two were actually close friends. Marquez would show Castro drafts of his unpublished books, and Castro, who himself refused to have U.S. satellite TV in his home, would go to Marquez's Cuban house to watch it, um, mostly for the sports. (laughs) Due to his left-wing views, the U.S. State Department actually denied him a visa to travel to the U.S. This was only rescinded in 1995 when Bill Clinton invited him to come visit Martha's Vineyard. 
Marquez really enjoyed his fame. He had homes in Mexico City, Barcelona, Paris, and one on Colombia's Caribbean coast. He was recognizable by his big bushy mustache, and he dressed well in white linen suits, shirts, shoes, and watch bands. He was said to be a really great company, funny, gossipy, and generous. Uh, he was married to his childhood sweetheart, Mercedes, for over 40 years and had two sons, Rodrigo and Gonzalo. In 1999, he was diagnosed with lymphoma and in 2012, dementia. He passed in 2014 at the age of 87. So quite a life, quite a life. Yeah. yeah. And so today we've gathered to talk about love in the time of cholera. In the late 1800s, in an unnamed Caribbean port city, a young telegraph operator named Florentino Ariza falls head over heels in love with Fermina Daza, a beautiful student he first sees on one of his work errands. They carry on a correspondence secretly through letters and telegrams. When Fermina Daza's father finds out about her suitor, he sends her away on a trip intended to make her forget the affair. Lorenzo Daza has much higher ambitions for his daughter than the humble Florentino. And yet... Florentino uses the secret brotherhood of telegraph operators, that's my own term, to continue the correspondence with Fermina in exile. Her grief at being torn away from her lover is profound, but when she returns, she breaks off the relationship, calling everything that has happened between them an illusion. So instead, she marries the elegant, cultured, and successful Dr. Juvenile Urbino. As the doctor's wife, she will think of herself as the happiest woman in the world. Though devastated by her rejection, Florentino Ariza is not one to be deterred. He has declared his eternal love for Fermina and determines to gain the fame and fortune he needs to win her back. When Fermina's husband at last dies, 51 years, 9 months, and 4 days and nights later, Florentino Ariza approaches Fermina again at her husband's funeral. There have been hundreds, perhaps even 622, a very specific number, of other affairs, but none of these women have captured his heart as Fermina did. As one of his lovers said, he is ugly and sad, but he is all love. Is this a love story? Or is something more going on here? Can we trust the narrator? Or are we being swept along like the great Rio Magdalena that figures so prominently in this story? Garcia Marquez beautifully and unflinchingly explores the nature of love in all its guises, small and large, passionate and serene. Love can emerge like a disease in these characters, but it can also outlast bleak decades of war and cholera and the effects of time itself. What did you guys think? Oh, man, you guys, I have complicated feelings about this one. Yeah. Me too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this was a reread for me. I first read this book maybe 15, 20 years ago. It was a long time ago. And at the time, I considered it one of my favorite books, but I don't anymore, um, because what I seemed to forget was how Garcia Marquez just casually writes about rape, sexual assaults, not to mention all the racism and the uh, misogyny in this book. Like, it's... It's so problematic in so many ways. But like, if we, if we compartmentalize, if we kind of push that to the side for a hot sec and pretend it doesn't exist, this book is very swoony just on a writing level. Like the, I mean, the writing is so, it's so lush and rich and detailed. Every paragraph, every sentence is so evocative. And I mean, this is a translation. Like, imagine what it's like in Spanish. And then, like, the love story itself is so swoony. I mean, Florentino's declarations of love, the serenades, the love letters, how he eats flowers, how he um, buys a mirror that Fermina is reflected in. Like, it's, it's so swoony. It's so romantic. But it was so hard for me to reconcile all those things, those things I really liked about it with all that problematic shit. Oh, it's complicated. You know, I gave you a lot there. No, it, it's interesting, <laughs> uh, Toby. And you know how often when we look back on our past or our childhood or whatever, we have a nostalgic look to it because we tend to remember the good things and we tend to try to forget the ugly things or the bad things. And so I'm wondering if that was maybe part of it, too, that before you did the reread and you thought of the book and you just thought of it without looking again, you thought of the parts of the book that moved you, that you liked, and the, the uglier aspects of it, you pushed down and only came up again because rereading it now, 15 years later with more insight, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just throwing that out. It's maybe a possibility because that happens to me sometimes and maybe a reason why 
it's always a trouble to revisit something that you once loved because if it doesn't hold up in the same way, then it, it kind of changes your entire feeling about, about the, uh, whatever it is, song, a, a book, movie, that kind of thing. I'm going to say I enjoyed this book, but enjoyed in a, um, with, with quotations around it because what I enjoyed about it was that it completely subverted any of my expectations as to what this book was going to be. I hadn't read it. I hadn't read any Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I was expecting sort of like a, this, uh, very lush, detailed, beautifully poetic, uh, love story that is over decades and lots of pitfalls, but in the end, the two get together and it's happy and, and, and it's, it's just a very, like you said, I like your word swoony. It, it, and so that's what I was expected going in. And I have to say, like Gabriel Garcia's writing is seductive. It, he was drawing me in to the point where I had to actually stop and say, no, 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 this, this is wrong. Like Florentino's a monster. Like, like, you know, it, no, he, this, it was almost like, I don't know if this was Garcia Marquez's intention, but it was almost like he was trying to like gaslight the reader into trying to accept things that we know are wrong. And there was a couple of times that happened. Like one time I'm, I'm thinking of is uh, after they break up and Florentino takes the boat trip up the Magdalena and, and it's a beautiful descriptive series of images of the people that he meets on the boat and the people alongside the shore. And he encounters that family of two women and the mother. And then he just kind of casually says, and they're, they're carrying a baby in a bird cage. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, is, is that a thing? And, and so I did a bunch of research and no, no, it's, it's not a thing. Uh, but then later on in the book, a couple hundred pages later, it talks about Florentino watching people get on a boat and it says, and there were people with babies in bird cages. And at that point, or at that point, I was like, Oh yeah, I guess, you know, sure. That makes sense. And so it's almost like, it's almost like he was grooming us to, it was a very persuasive read that I had to keep stopping myself and, and say, no, no, look what's going on here. Like this is like a stalker obsessed with somebody who, is over him. Yeah. Anyway, the, the fact that I found the read so unexpected is what I enjoyed about it. I'm going to echo the complicated feelings about this book thing. And I do have to say, too, like one of the things about looking back at a book that you enjoyed previously, sometimes I find it's just our awareness of certain things has changed over time. Like there are books and, and movies and stuff I saw when I was younger that I thought were fine. But when I look back at them, you know, through the current lens they are terrible in many ways and part of that is the way that people treat each other you know the uh you mentioned the racism that's uh, throughout the book the misogyny the the casual rape i mean <laughs> both florentino and one of his many lovers both describe being raped and liking it and wanting to get back together with their rapist you know and the time when florentino rapes that woman and then blames it on a couple of workers and wrecks their lives to cover his own crime it's like it was so casual and tossed out so i, I have a theory about this and the various aspects of the book I kind of feel like, and I don't have any evidence to back this up, but my own feeling, that he was writing a parody of romance. Because, you know, romance novels, one of the tropes is, you know, you have the scoundrel, who is this uh, wicked person, but they're kind of redeemed by the end of the story. And so here we have Florentino, who is a scoundrel, uh, like he's a stalker, uh, right, right from the beginning, and doesn't take no for an answer. And then as you go through the novel, you just find out worse and worse things about him. Like, oh, he's he's having sex with his 14-year-old relative that he was explicitly given to care for and protect. And Yeah, that's, uh, where, I, that's where I drew the line. Come on. <laughs> I, I don't it's, think it's a coincidence that that's at the very end of the novel. Yeah, I know. When when maybe you've built up some sympathy for him. and But no, toss it right in there. Do you still love him? Is he still lovable? You know? And the extravagance, like waiting over 50 years for someone with no indication of their love at all is like a real exaggeration of the trope of, you know, just sticking in there and, and being there for the person that you love. I don't know. I, I felt like maybe it was intended as a parody to exaggerate every feature of a traditional romance and make it so ridiculous. But I don't know. I like that theory. And that makes me think about Dr. Urbino's death at the beginning and how 
hilarious and unexpected that is and that kind of mm-hmm. would be a really good setup to make the rest of the novel a parody you know just this super intelligent bird that he's trying to get out of a tree like it's it's pretty funny yeah i was not expecting that plot twist uh, 60 pages in it was like janet lee and psycho all of a sudden it's like oh, okay i guess dr Irvino is not the main character because the first first third of the book is following him exclusively like in intimate details of him walking around and visiting things and going to that colleague's luncheon and all the little kind of details that Garcia Marquez throws in to a, a marriage about how they how they live and stuff. And I thought, well, this is kind of sweet. And then I'm like, well, no, okay, what's happening now? <laughs> Who's this guy? Who's this Florentino guy that showed up? Yeah, the structure of the novel is very disruptive. Like, time is very fluid. It starts the book mostly towards the end of the story. And then hops forward in time and then just jumps back and forth here and there. It's like, you know, he's going into something and then 10 years earlier, he had done such and such. And, you know, it's like, well, where are we now? Like, I never felt really certain where I was in the timeline through most of the story, which is also complicated by the, like, we mentioned the detail in the writing. He tosses in so many details about everything all of the time. Like, they don't just go out for the evening. You know, they go out and they're photographed by a Dutch photographer who was recently on a trip to the Antilles, who had done this and that. And and then you're like five paragraphs later, and it goes back to what he was talking about. And it's like, wait, what just happened? There are so many details. Towards the end, I started to think of it more as word painting. Because usually I try to pay attention to details when they're given in a story because I figure they might be important. But after a while, I realized there were so many details that none of them were important. It was all just in service of giving you an image in your mind. Uh, Or at least I have to assume that's it because there was no way I could keep up with all of those details. It was just too many. (laughs) Yeah, this book actually took me quite a long time to get through because of that. Like, I I was constantly going back and rereading paragraphs and pages just to, because I was like, did I, what, did I miss something? Like, what am I getting out of this? What's important here? What do I need to know to move on to the next paragraph? So it was a laborious read. I found it a very difficult, dense read as well. And part of that, I think, had to do with there was very little actual dialogue. And when you read dialogue in a book, at least when I do, you can skip through pages a lot because you kind of read it in a conversational style and the sentences tend to be shorter and you get the gist of something. But this was so much description that even when if you look at the text on the page, it's like a wall of text. And uh, I don't even know if I could call them chapters. They, they were like chunks of story that were maybe were 40 to 60 pages long. And I only knew it was a new thing because there was a little blank spot at the top of the page, kind of a, a, like a major ind- indentation. I was like, okay, we were starting something new, which just added to the whole feeling that we were being kind of sold a story that may not be exactly... It's been well-crafted, which, speaking of theories, I had this crazy theory partway through with the narrator, because there were a couple of times with the narrator where he said one thing, and then later on turned out not to be true, and there were certain things that were inconsistent, and I I started to wonder if Florentino was the narrator, and that he is it had, it, he's telling us the story at the very end, which is why the narrator is so sympathetic toward Florentino's actions. I don't know, but I just felt like whoever the narrator was, he's definitely on Team Florentino. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, come on. And, you know, Dennis, your, your comment about the different timelines, that part of it normally would drive me bonkers. But in this book, I really enjoyed or I thought that was a strength in the writing. Like, for example, when Fermina and Dr. Urbano came back from their honeymoon and you see that it feels like from several different perspectives at several different kind of overlapping times throughout the book, you see it from Florentino's perspective standing on the dock and you see it from Fermina's perspective coming back and even the doctor and, and, and they all have quite a slightly different take on what that returning to Columbia meant. And it was done in such a kind of a, like you said, like an overlapping way there that at first I was like, Oh, okay. We're back to talking about this again. Or, or I was, didn't we already talk about this? I'm like, no, no. Okay. We did, but this was from a different perspective. And to me, it just kind of was another example of his sort of mesmerizing writing style that it was almost a dreamlike. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are things that happened in this book that honestly, I'm not even sure if they happened like towards the end of the, the book after, well, close to the end when Fermina 
reads that newspaper article about Dr. Urbino spoilers having an affair and it's like a very a very scandalous you know thing and and she leaves she leaves him for is it about two years about two yeah. years I was gonna say I, thought I was gonna say it couldn't be two years but yeah it was, and but then the way it's written like did he have the affair or was it like um just a terrible rumor that was started because it seems like her friend denied it and so that's what i mean but like nothing's really cut and dried and mm -hmm. anyway i don't know that's yeah that's I'm gonna suck. i feel like saying not cut and dried is like the essence of the book nothing is simple in the book at all even towards the end when after all of these decades, they're finally getting together and being romantic with each other. There's still so many stops and starts. It never fully smooths out. She's always pulling back a bit. He's always pushing forward and losing the maturity that he seemed to have gained. Like There's never just a comfortable spot where everything flows smoothly until maybe the very end. Maybe. But you always feel like there's still going to be all of that back and forth dance kind of uncertainty. We try this. Nope. Now you're mad. Nope. Now you're happy. Now, <laughs> you know? I, ironically, the only time they seem to go smoothly is when they pretend they have cholera and they get to go right down the <laughs> river without stopping. Yeah. That, that's about as smooth as it got at any point. <laughs> oh, and the constant mentions of cholera. It felt weird, you know. Considering what like a gross disease it is and then to i mean i guess that's that's maybe the whole part of it or part of even the parody i mean cholera is yeah. is disgusting and how do you how do you put love and cholera next to each other that's part of it though like he describes so many different romantic relationships and some of them were disgusting right like and you kind of get the sense that okay love is kind of disgusting uh, at least some forms of love and what is love? Yeah. <laughs> love love is forcing your wife to take an enema when you have to take one, so you both have the same experience, <laughs> I guess, according to Dr. Urbino. <laughs> yeah. It's so romantic. Yeah, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> Double enemas. Sorry. The enema dilemma? The enema. <laughs> Alternate title. The, the dilemma. <laughs> that, that may be our fan fiction that we could write. <laughs> <laughs> I also found, too, like one of the constant themes of the novel was lying. Florentino lied constantly uh, to maintain his privacy. And a central part of the story of the book is that he promised he would always be true to Fermina. And then he had hundreds and hundreds of affairs. And then when they got together, he basically denied that he'd ever been with anybody, uh, that he had been true to her this entire time. He was um, true in his heart. Well, <laughs> but not his loins. <laughs> but that's that's the thing, though. Was he true? I mean, I don't think anyone has to promise never to see anybody for 50 years for someone who doesn't want to be with them. Like, you know, I, I figure that promise was really rendered null and void when she said, I never want to see you again. Over and <laughs> like, over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, she was extremely clear about that. Go away. I don't want to spend any time with you. We had a, it was a fant fantastical, imaginative type thing, but it wasn't real. Yeah, like when they were teenagers. Uh, yeah, well, that's the other thing. Like they started out very, very young. She was like 14 or something like that when this started, and she was 18 when she decided, no, that's ridiculous. I don't want to keep this relationship going. That's a very young age. There was the other thing I found about it too. Like there was a lot of pressure, especially on the women. Florentino really put pressure on her to uh, get her to be in a relationship with him. And then when she stood up to him and said, no, no, I don't want that, Dr. Urbino really cranked the gears up. You know, she's getting visits from people from the church, from her dad. Like, everyone is like, no, no, you got to marry. This guy's pretty good. You know, he's, he's handsome. He's rich. He's famous. You know, you, you got to get together with this guy. What do you think? So much pressure, and clearly throughout a lot of the story, she did not want to be in a relationship with Dr. Urbino. And even afterwards, when she described it as like a, a good marriage overall, but she keeps questioning even that right to the end. The one interesting thing about the end is where, as a widow, she finally had some freedom. But even there, Florentino keeps showing up and won't leave her alone. Just wears her down. I, yeah, yeah, I did like that, that one moment when her... Was her daughter or her daughter-in-law was saying, "Oh, it's ridiculous experiencing love at this at this age." And then for me, it just kind of snapped, and she said, "You know what? I wasn't allowed to do what I wanted to do when I was young. Now I'm not being allowed to do when I'm old. So 
get out of my house. I don't want to see you. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Like, it was a moment where I just felt like, okay, she's got agency. She's in charge now. She can do what she wants. Because you're right, even though she probably would look back on her marriage with Dr. Urbino as a happy one, there was many passages where she was being told what to think. She was being told what to do. If she, she There was one time where she had a, like a dream and her mother was like, oh, no, you're, you know, you're not supposed to dream like that or whatever. Uh, and, and she was so, it was stifling. But from the outside world, looking in from uh, Florentino's perspective, uh, she was, had the perfect marriage and the perfect life of always being able to go to these uh, galas and functions and uh, fancy parties and things. But the, uh, the reality was she never had control till you said at the end when she was widowed at the age of 70, whatever, and start to make her own choices. Yeah, that whole uh, agency thing. I mean, I pulled out the quote. He believes that when a woman says no, she is waiting to be urged before making her final decision. Um, Mm -hmm. So just like a lot of a lot of like, no, doesn't mean no, no means like, just keep trying. Um, And you just see like the women in this novel just being punished for their agency. I mean, I think about poor aunt um, Escolastica, who was oh, banished yeah. just because she took letters, like Florentino's letters to Fermina, like poor Aunt Escolastica, Escolastica, whatever her name is. Like, I, I felt so bad for her. And like, um, mm-hmm. America, the, you know, young girl who Florentino's having an affair with, she kills herself. Yeah. And again, that's very casual. Like, oh yeah, I heard on the boat that she killed herself. And that's, sad and I feel bad for her family, but like, oh, well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like like he's missing like a a moral compass or he's exhibiting like sociopathic tendencies. Like when he has the affair with the uh, the married woman and he, he paints that message on her belly and and her husband sees it and kills her. Florentino's reaction isn't so much grieving or feeling responsible for it, he's more worried about finding out when the husband is going to get out of jail and whether whether he's found out because he's he's worried that he, he, his secrets could be found out or that he, he personally is going to come in under harm. So I mean, th- th- those aren't normal reactions to terrible things. Yeah, and he keeps having affairs with people too, despite the fact that he has contributed to the death of one person. Um, at least one. At at that point. Yeah. yeah. And there's the other thing. I mean, given the way that the story is told, who knows how many other lives he's completely destroyed with his actions. We know about the one rape because it was explicitly mentioned. Uh, we know about the one lover being killed by her husband because of what he had painted on her belly. We know about the suicide of his I don't know what relation she was to him, but his young relative that he had groomed and then um, molested. So we know at least, you know, four lives that he's destroyed in one way or another. Uh, How many others would there be given that he's had and the 622 affairs were only the ones that were important enough to write down. There were all sorts of other casual ones. The man is a a walking tornado just wrecking everything around him, but keeping himself looking all upright and beyond reproach to most people. He has a very hard character to like. Yeah, and then there's there's Leona, um, who works at the River Company. I think she's a bit of a foil to all of that because... Hmm. Florentino does not sleep with her. Uh, I, I, I feel like they do. They want to, but they don't. They, they kind of just get through the passion and just become friends. And then, you know, she's able to like rise in the ranks and sort of create a career for herself. But I'm, I wonder about her throat and whether, you know, she is kind of like, the example of what a woman can be, but is she this way because she's not sexualized? It does say at one point that uh, this was the relationship that taught him you could just be friends with a woman. I thought, okay, (laughs) that's the one example in his life he's had of friendship with a woman. The book talks a lot about love and the importance of love and embracing love and this and that, but he can't have simple friendship with half of the population because uh, he's so sexualized and everything is about sex all the time with him. I'm reminded of uh, something I read many years ago, like, don't base your romantic instincts on romantic comedies, because, you know, the relationships they tend to depict are never healthy. And he had so few relationships that I would consider healthy, not that I'm a relationship expert or anything, but, you know, it's just, I wouldn't use Florentino as an example of how to conduct oneself with anybody. 
that's the area where I have the most uh, negative feelings about the book is just the types of relationships described I wouldn't wish on anyone. But it was beautifully written. <laughs> we can always come back to that. And when I think about it, like, I really didn't like most of the book, except the writing was was lovely, you know, but I didn't really like any of the characters. And I didn't really like most of the decisions any of the characters made. Hmm. Makes me think maybe I just didn't like the book at all. <laughs> if we're if we're all like very into the the actual writing, I mean, I guess we need to shout out the translator um, mm -hmm. because this book was originally written in Spanish. I think it's I forget who the translator is, but um, I mean, she did a remarkable job. I'm just looking this up on my copy. It's a woman, but I forget her name. Edith Grossman. I mean. Translation is really an art, and it's hard to imagine how she even did this, how I wish I could read Spanish because I'd be so curious as to what, if it's still as beautiful in the Spanish as in the English. I think I read a quote somewhere that um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez actually thought the English translation of 100 Years of Solitude was better than the Spanish. Um, mm. So that's a real compliment for for the translator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, it's just some of those passages that read like poetry, like towards the last couple pages, where uh, the narrator is talking about how Florentino realizes that it's life, not death, which has no limits. Uh, little moments like that are just so beautiful, even though it's in the context of a of a monster who seems to be rewarded for his horrible behavior his whole life. So. But, but in the moment when you're reading the words, you're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I guess one of the things you can draw from a book like this is that it does push you to ask the question, what is love? Because it, it talks a lot about love. Like, everything is love. He was full of love. He needed love. Uh, he loved her. He loved him. You know, so much love. But what is love? It never really defines it. Which also reminds me of how, like, the book apparently takes place in Colombia, but I don't think he says Colombia once the entire book. And the country's name is never mentioned. And I kept forgetting where he was. <laughs> <laughs> and love is m mentioned a lot, but never really defined in any way. It just seems to be equivalent to passion or sex. An obsession. Yes. It's that hot flame of passion from youth that uh, Florentino anyway never outgrows apparently feels that way right up until uh, the end of the book but it doesn't really talk about love that much and in that context you know sometimes you get a song in your head when you're reading a book the song in my head for this book was what is love by Howard Jones which may be the single greatest treatise on love ever put to music in his words and maybe love is letting people be just what they want to be. The door must always be left unlocked. To love one circumstance may lead someone away from you and not to spend the time just doubting. I thought, man, Florentino really needed to hear that. And he never did. <laughs> Speaking of songs that pop in your head when you're reading, the song that popped into my head when I was reading this book was Love in an Elevator by Aerosmith. <laughs> but but in my mind, I was changing the words to Love in the Time of Cholera. But it was the same tune as Love in an Elevator. That is a cover that needs to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> you need you to record that for the outro. <laughs> Did you have any songs that were going through your head, Toby, when you read this? Um, no. I guess I, when I think of love songs, I think of sentimentality and um, sort of like cheesiness, which... The love in this book is neither of those things. I mean, there is maybe some sentimentality with Florentino because, you know, he's always trying to sort of bring back the, the love that he felt as a, as a teen for, for Fermina. But yeah, the love in this book was just very, um, very odd, very more, more obsession than love, I think. And as an aside, uh, a movie was made of this book about 15 years ago with Javier Bardem as Florentino. And the soundtrack was by Shakira, who is another famous <laughs> Colombian. And it is kind of schmaltzy. I listened to a bit of the songs. I watched a bit of the movie, but yeah, there's no comparison. I mean, you don't have the language to go along with it. And uh, they in the movie, they really toned down Florentino's horribleness. So you're kind of left with this kind of limpid love story. It's beautifully shot, though. 
I have to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if either of you have had a chance to see either the trailer or the movie at all, but I have not. Uh, no. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't rush out and watch it. Uh, but uh, anyway, Shakira, though, shout out to her. <laughs> mm-hmm. One of the questions we asked on social media was, uh, "Have you ever reunited with a past flame after a long period, and how did it go?" I think we had a response on that one, right? Yes, we did have a response. Um, Carrie664 wrote, Yeah, no, we broke up for a reason, and I don't believe in getting back with someone once we broke up. After all, the reasons we broke up will still be there, whether it was on me or on them. Mm -hmm. So good points there. So Carrie is definitely on team for Mina, I think. (laughs) For sure. I have to admit that uh, I have gotten together with a past flame in the sense that my wife and I, when we were dating, we actually broke up twice and ended up getting back together. And so I will say you can get past the things that broke you up in the first place, or at least we did in our case, because we, one of the strengths of my relationship with my wife, if I do say so myself, is that we talk a lot and we communicate and we listen to each other. And we did eventually figure out what we were miscommunicating about early on. So I think it is possible, but That's my only experience with it, really. And it wasn't a long period apart either. Like, it definitely wasn't 50 years. It was more like, you know, a couple of weeks later, that kind of thing. I can't can't imagine getting back together with any of the people that I dated, uh, like, you know, even 30 years ago. I just don't see how that would work. It's interesting we use the term getting back together. But, I mean, Florentino and Firmina, were they ever really together? I mean, a few letters, a few telegrams. I mean, uh well, hun- hundreds of letters, okay. it sounds like. <laughs> sure, sure, hundreds sure, sure, of sure. Letters. But they're they teenagers. They were apart, too. Well, like, they weren't even in the same yeah. the same place for several years. Oh, I mean, we're talking about an era where there wasn't any Netflix. I mean, what else are you going to do at night but write letters and send telegrams to, right? Yes. Before we move on to our next section, do you guys have any final thoughts on the book that you wanted to share? We could talk about the racism if if we want to go there. There's that whole anti-Chinese interlude that I thought was really weird. Um, <laughs> the funny, I mean, I, oh gosh, I sound like a monster saying that. The racism, <laughs> it's funny, but there's a the part where there was the the poetry festival, and yeah. then there, the, that's not the part you're talking about where the Chinese yeah. guy wins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. the good Chinese and, and the bad Chinese. <laughs> yeah, and then the, yeah. The, everyone's like, we can't understand what the poem uh, or whatever, and and everyone's mad because uh, a Chinese person won. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, when they look back on it, they're like, oh, you know, now when we look at it, the Chinese guy's poem wasn't really that good, so we can <laughs> totally dismiss that. There was the yeah, a lot of racism about you know the black woman uh, or the mulattoes. And when I'm reading something that's historical in this way, I often wonder. It's like, well, okay, it's depicting that particular time period, and racism was definitely a part of the culture. So it's like maybe being an accurate reflection of the time period, but it's also very uncomfortable to read. And the way it's tossed around, the same as it's. The ideas of love and relationships and marriage and and all of that is tossed around. I felt uncomfortable with pretty much all of those opinions. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to read uh, for sure. I mean, I'm team for Mina Daza um, as well, but like that bit when she gets really upset that um, about her husband's affair because it's a black woman, like that's mm. that's her main <laughs> point of contention. Oh, it's so so problematic. <laughs> Yeah, Uh, that's why, you know, it's a complex novel. It evokes a lot of things. And sometimes art is intended to make one uncomfortable. It's hard to see what the point of the story was in a lot of ways, unless you view it simply as a parody, uh, as a almost a destruction of the concept of the romantic novel. If you view it as anything other than that, I, I find it difficult to find the point of the story other than keep loving guy, you know, <laughs> I mean, I love, <laughs> I love the theory that it's a parody, but I, I do think it's sincere. Um, you know, it was, it was written in the eighties. If we look at sort of where Garcia Marquez is from and the values that he would have growing up, um, in the fifties and, this, uh, and earlier in South America, I mean, I think misogyny and racism were probably rife in his world. And unfortunately, those translated into his novel. I feel like if he was still alive, there would be sort of a big reckoning here with him. Um, and he would maybe 
talk publicly about hopefully um, his missteps here, but I, I unfortunately think this book is is a sincere love story. My final thoughts on it, uh, just take back to the beginning where I said I enjoyed this book, but I enjoyed it with quotations because I enjoyed it sort of in the meta sense of, of how it seemed to kind of play with its audience and subvert my expectations and kind of make me question the things that I'm reading. And, and so it's, it's an exercise that way. I found it an, an interesting read. And, and look at what this discussion has all led to us talking about, too, about whether that was Garcia Marquez's intention or not. We don't know. In fact, like you said, Toby, his translation in English was he thought was better than Spanish. So maybe there are some things that when people write, they're not consciously thinking of. But then when we read the material, we, we take from it what we bring to it. And this might be a case of that, too. I'm still left unable to really summarize my feelings about the book in any particular way other than very mixed, very challenging. <laughs> so with all of that said... Uh, let's move on to our next segment called, Can You Tell Me a Book I Would Also Like? Carrying on with the theme of Columbia, let's just say, and not really knowing what was real and historic and what was made up and the mix of everything. I, I sort of learned after I read this book was I didn't know really anything about Columbia. So I picked up this book called Magdalena, River of Dreams by uh, Wade Davis, which was published last year. And if you haven't heard of Wade Davis, he's a Canadian anthropologist, a photographer, a writer, and an adventurer. And in fact, he was the explorer in residence, which is kind of an oxymoron, explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society from 1999 to 2013. And he's currently the professor of anthropology and the BC leadership chair of, in cultures and ecosystems at risk at UBC. He's written 20 books. Uh, the most famous one, possibly, is his first one called The Serpent and the Rainbow, which was a nonfiction account into his investigation into zombies in Haiti. And if that sounds like a horror novel, you may not be surprised that, in fact, uh, Wes Craven, the creator of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, adapted that nonfiction book into a horror movie of the same name in the mid-'80s. But in this book, Magdalena... It's part travelogue and part history lesson, and that he travels the uh, Magdalena River and tells us about the places and the people he meets, and he explains how the Magdalena played a central role in Columbia's development and it, its current environmental state. Um, and then he uses these encounters as bookends to reflect on Columbia's history, stretching back to the liberator, Simon Bolivar, up to and beyond Pablo Escobar, the Colombian drug lord, whose operation in the 70s and 80s would generate $70 million a day, so much so that he had to budget $1,000 a week just for rubber bands to wrap the stacks of cash. But sadly, uh, uh, Wade Davis doesn't mention Shakira at all. <laughs> if, you, oh. if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the uh, Columbia, I highly recommend Magdalena, River of Dreams. Nice. Sounds very good. Yeah. Oh, and he also mentions Gabriel Garcia Marquez a whole lot and, and mentions uh, Love in the Time of Cholera and everything. So I just throw that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, I struggled a bit with this one. I I wanted to recommend 100 Years of Solitude by Garcia Marquez um, because he's very much known for magical realism and there's really no magical, well, not much magical realism in this book. I thought I would recommend that because it is chock full. But again, it's been 15 years since I've read that book, and I'm really worried that there's going to be um, some, <laughs> some bad stuff there. Uh, so I, I can't recommend that one with a clear conscience. And then I was also thinking, well, maybe maybe this is a genre, maybe like problematic books that are gorgeously written is like a new thing, in which case the epitome would probably be Lolita by Nabokov. But I don't want to recommend that one either because it's it's gorgeously written, but it's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so so don't read don't read Lolita. Um, so uh, I'm going out a little bit on left field uh, with this one, and I'm recommending Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. The only real thing it has in common with Love in the Time of Cholera is it's set in South America. There is a love story involved with it. But if you haven't read anything by Ann Patchett, she's she's one of my favorite writers. Bel Canto is about um, there's this lavish birthday party at a politician's house in South America. It has all sorts of fancy international guests, Japanese businessmen, um, this famous opera star. 
And then terrorists come and take over the party. They hold everyone hostage. And these really beautiful relationships develop between the terrorists and the hostages and the terrorists and the hostages. And it's wonderfully written. I really think Ann Patchett is one of the greatest living American writers. She's, I mean, you can't go wrong with any of her books. And Bel Canto is uh, is one of the best. And um, yeah, I, I recommend that one. Thank you. Yeah. So for me, if you enjoyed the florid prose of Love in the Time of Cholera, the magic realism, the ridiculously over-the-top descriptions of the feelings of love, the historical setting, the lack of a clear and simple way to interpret the story, and the fact that it was translated from Spanish, you might also enjoy Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes. The first part was published in 1605, and it has been described as the first modern novel. The story revolves around the adventures of a man who reads so many chivalric romances that he loses his mind and decides to become a knight-errant to revive chivalry and serve his nation under the name Don Quixote de la Mancha. He recruits a simple farmer, Sancho Panza, as his squire, who often employs a unique, earthy wit in dealing with Don Quixote's rhetorical monologues on knighthood. I read this book many years back and remember it as a wild ride that elicited a variety of emotions— I don't remember all of the details, so hopefully it's not problematic in the same way that uh, Love in the Time of Cholera is. I don't think so. It was more comic elements to it and tragic elements to it. Uh, but it is a, it is a big book. It is uh, a longer read. But uh, if you like this one, you will likely like that one as well. That's on my bucket so, list reads. It's yeah. a big one. It's like yeah. It is a big one, yeah. yeah. But there are so many references from it that have made uh, it into modern culture, like tilting at windmills. I don't know. I think it's worth a read. And the, but you definitely have to be in the mood for it. Yeah. And if, if you're not up for the book, there's a, a musical was made out of it called The Man of La Mancha. <laughs> yes. We'll there have been that. a lot of reinterpretations of it as well. So now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, wherein our hosts reveal their deeply obsessive love of words by telling you about a particular word or phrase we're currently enraptured by. My word is taken directly from Love in the Time of Cholera. There was one point in the book where Fermina's father, because he was uh, an immigrant and because he wasn't part of the right social status, was not allowed into the the, the, the club that everyone else was. And, and the term that Garcia Marquez used was he was blackballed and I've heard that term a lot. And I just thought, what, what, what does that mean? Cause it, cause the way it was in the book, it sounded like he was literally, there were black balls involved uh, in something. And so I looked it up and sure enough, the term, which it means to be rejected or to be blacklisted, let's say, although blacklisted is kind of had sort of McCarthyism kind of overtones, but it's a, uh, if you blackball somebody, it's it's a way. Uh, it's a secret ballot where everyone in a club is given the option of putting a white ball or a black ball in a special little ballot box, where a white ball is a yes vote and a black ball is a no vote, and then it's used when a, an organization's rules provide that one or two objections, rather than uh, at least fifty uh, percent are sufficient to defeat a uh, proposition. So if, if, for example, a membership in a club, uh, if the club rules are that it has to be a unanimous decision to admit somebody, then the black ball box is used where members can vote against a person without them it's knowing who voted against. And so once the the balls are revealed, so to speak, uh, if there are any black ones in the box, then the person is denied membership. So anyway, I thought that it was, and I found a picture online of, of a actual ballot box that's used and it's kind of, kind of neat looking. So I'll maybe put a picture of that up on our, on our notes page. So blackballing. Good one. <laughs> and I got to say balls on the, on the air. So just, just, you know, there we are. All right. So my word, I was reminded of this word when recently playing apples to apples with my family. It's an adjective that I will always use in that game, no matter what the noun or verb is that you're playing with. And it's a word that I think is fitting for Florentino, and that is woebegone. Um, which is a really interesting word in several, several ways. It means the opposite of what it sounds like, you know, it means someone who's miserable or sad. 
And it comes from Middle English phrase, woe be gone, where woe is woe and begone is a pa- the past participle, meaning the set. But something that I find kind of interesting about this word is there's sort of some magic about it. It's kind of like an incantation, like when you are referring to someone as woe be gone, you are saying woe be gone. It's like you're you're calling them sad or miserable, but you're also like casting a bit of a spell on them that they might not be for for much longer. So I uh, I really like that word. <laughs> nice. So uh, this month's book naturally made me think a lot about how we talk about love and how we talk about our feelings in general. There are a lot of things, people, and ideas that I love, like, and dislike, but there are also people, things, and ideas that I have very mixed feelings about, which brings us to my nerd word for this month, ambivalence. Ambivalence is often confused with indifference, but they are not the same thing. Indifference is when you really don't like or dislike something or don't have a real preference between the available options. Ambivalence is when you both like and dislike something simultaneously. To be more precise, ambivalence is when you have simultaneous and contradictory attitudes or feelings, such as attraction and repulsion, towards an object, person, or action. The world is a complicated place, and human emotions are more complicated still, so ambivalence seems, to me, a natural and authentic response to many things. It also seems to me that we often resist expressing ambivalence in public discussions. Our culture often encourages us to express strong opinions and to avoid appearing wishy-washy, so we often express either a pro or a con position. We love something or we hate it, it's good or it's bad. But I encourage you, dear reader, to feel free to express your contradictory opinions, too. It's okay to both like and dislike a book or an author or a movie or a flavor. It's okay to acknowledge that something you approve of also bothers you on some levels, or that someone you dislike has positive qualities that you admire. Embrace the complexity of life and embrace your ambivalence. I think you just summed up our uh, feelings about this book. I think that was the whole discussion. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. You can just cut all the rest out and just put that. Yeah. 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 I was thinking we'll that have a- when I was doing the summary, uh, I almost felt like saying, well, the answer's in the title. <laughs> but I felt I should probably go a little bit further. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For next month, we're moving from love to Lovecraft and reading Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. This novel explores the conjunction between the horror fiction of H.P. Lovecraft and racism in the United States during the era of Jim Crow laws, as experienced by black science fiction fan Atticus Turner and his family. It's fun and scary and all kinds of interesting things, so I hope you enjoy. Have an idea about what we should read next? Let us know. You can find all our contact info at the bottom of the page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all of our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and maybe leave us a review. Tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time Time to read. Read. out of the way or are we ready to dive in i'm ready yeah if anything i'm over prepared this time which i always feel i'm underprepared so we'll see how it goes (laughs)